this talk is based on uh, really some of the last projects I worked on. D David Parker and I, plus a cast of others, uh, were involved with a pretty extensive drilling and modeling program. And David retired in August of 2019. I retired in 2020. So there's a date stamp on some of this information. I understand there's been a lot more drilling, but uh, we'll proceed with this. So um, most of you are aware, t t Tucson, you take um, I-10 East past Wilcox and you head up to um, Safford and the Lone Star Deposit is situated just northeast of there. I've shown on here for reference the other porphyry copper deposits in Arizona and New Mexico. This is a geologic map of the Safford district. This map is from Hauser uh, and others. And, and here, you, um, I'm not used to this light. Anyway, the green is uh, some Cretaceous andesite. You can see the purple color are some laramide stocks. Uh, covering that are some Miocene and Oligocene volcanic rocks and the quaternary is in various shades of yellow. I've shown the uh, porphyry copper deposits there. You can see Lone Star is highlighted in uh, the red circle and the others, Dos Pobre, San Juan, Joy, and Sanchez to the southeast. The numbers you see are is the copper endowment for these systems, that's based on the production reserves and mineral, resource, mineral resources, they're an estimate, but it just sort of gives you a, a, a sense in terms of the variability and the size of the deposits in the district there. So, how was Lone Star found? Um, early prospectors started in the late 1800s and they were mostly mining veins that are proximal to the Lone Star DVD posit. Late 40s, uh, a company I've never heard of, consolidated copper mines, drilled several holes, didn't go very, very deep. But it really kicked off in the 50s. On and Cook and some of the others with uh, Bear Creek uh, did some systematic recon of the Gila Mountains. And the hematitic leach cap actually did crop out in the range front and they uh, observed copper oxide in, in veins that kind of got them attracted. Did some more um, mapping and sampling and did an initial wide space drilling pro program and they intersected some significant oxide copper. So this is a map of Lone, of Lone Star here and, and that's a pit at, at some time. And then the annex area, I'll be talking about that, is situated uh, southwest. So Kennecott did some drilling pro programs like I mentioned, including uh, some that intersected some calcopyrite, but they didn't go very deep into those. Some subsequent work, and I don't understand the full history, they actually chased some of the stuff to the southwest and drilled some pretty interesting uh, intercepts in the annexed area. So included with that was uh, they completed an 800 foot shaft and 3,000 feet of drifts so they could get underground in the oxide part of the DE deposit to do some more drilling and bulk sampling. So one of the things, if you think about 1961 and you have a huge oxide deposit buried beneath a lot of rocks, how do you process that? How do you mine that? Uh, this was before SXEW started in the 80s and so you were looking at different sorts of things and Kennecott realized that they had a huge deposit but how do they, how do they process it? How do they mine it? So one of the things that happened in the, in, the, in the 60s was the US Atomic Energy Co Co Commission was looking for peaceful ways to use atomic weapons. And one of the things they looked at here is this project called Project Sloop. And this is the cover of the report. And in the re report, they talk about you detonate the bomb 
and in a half a second it propagates and within hours it does that and ultimately, according to the model, would produce a large cave. And they, they looked at this as a way to fracture the rock that they could leach in situ the copper DD deposits that are now being, that were mined in the Lone Star Pit. And as a reference, you can see this same figure over here, and here's a graph of the copper grades on one of the holes, so you can see, you know, you're, you, on, for the most part, you're looking at grades in, in excess of 0.45, as Chris Cola. So in this day and age, you would, and it's been done there, you would, you, would, you would mine it and you would leach that, but at that time, there wasn't a viable alter alternative for processing it. So Phelps Dodge acquired um, Lone Star in 1986 as part of, part of the deal to get uh, the Chino mine. And uh, they, they did incremental work through 2007, basically drilled out the oxide DU deposit and really did an amazing battery of uh, leach test work of the various ore types to determine recoveries. Freeport acquired Phelps Dodge in March of 2007 and continued uh, drilling was focused mostly on uh, the super gene, but there was some deeper drilling done, uh, most of that in, in the latter time. And then in 2015, a notable event happened. There was um, the uh, oxide had been drilled, drilled out and there was a, a geomechanical drilling program to determine the slope angles of the pit. And so we were, look, the, our, the exploration group was looking at the core and, and they would log it every single day and notice that at, at where the hole was gonna end, there was still some significant alteration and mineralization and continued the hole and actually banged into over 2,000 feet of 0.83 as calcopyrite. So that is the kind of intercept that gets you noticed and so um, from that, uh, it actually took a year, but there was pretty aggressive drilling pro programs budgeted where there were step outs and wide space deep holes to test the limit of the sulfide ore body. So this is um, actually a slide from a Freeport McMoran 2018 second quarter analyst presentation, and you can see there some of the intercepts that were drilled. Those are in meters, fairly significant, and this is all stuff below the oxide, and here are some of the intercepts of note, almost 4,000 feet at 0.63, 2,400 at 0.6, 4,900 at 0.5. Some of the holes went down 6,000 feet. I mean, they were drilling to the geology, and this is a system we knew was big, but it goes to the fact that we had uh, daily sort of quick logs, if you will, we're looking at the core and you're making the decisions, do you keep drilling, do you stop, those kind of things, and that was invaluable in terms of actively managing the program to the drill results. It's production and reserves, um, 20, 20 through 2022, I got this off uh, the Freeport Form 10K report the other day. It's mined about 550 million pounds. The uh, summary of uh, the mining and what Freeport thinks about is in this slide. That's from that same presentation. The reserves, these are based on a $3 copper price or 1 billion tons of a 0.4 with the recoverable pounds of about 6.7 billion. If you look at mineralized, mineral resources, that's using a copper price at 350. These numbers are in addition to the reserves, measured and indicated 3.3 billion at a 0.334 with another 900 million of crushed leach. If you bring the inferred in, the total 4.5 billion at a 0.33 with another billion of crushed leach and their contained pounds of that is almost 40 billion. So these are huge deposits, if you think of it in that way. So, but wait, there's more. 
there's an additional sulfide potential of perhaps an upwards of another $50, bill, $50 billion dependence on drilling and economics and those sort of things. So you can get a sense from this, this is absolutely a monster. This thing is, is, is huge and it's amazing, at least for me, to have had the opportunity to work on this kind of DD deposit from its infancy from a mining and a drilling and a modeling standpoint because having spent a lot of time in Marinci, by the time I got there it had been mined 130 years and so a lot of the stuff that was original is obviously gone. Well here it was intact. So that's an amazing opportunity to, to look at those things. So moving on to the to the Lone Star area. This is a geologic map of the area. The green is uh, the Safford and a site that's Cretaceous. I'll talk more about that. The Lone Star stock is in purple. That's a pre-hypogene stock. The, uh, there's a series of diatremes. That's the blue colors that sort of have a northwest southeast orientation and then a series of uh, dikes. There's four dike types and they cross cut the Lone Star stock and were intimately in a genetic sense related to the formation of the diatremes. Overlying that are um, Oligocene to Miocene volcanic rocks. I'll talk more about that. But um, they were critical because they basically preserved the deposit from erosion. Here's the cross section. The Lone Star stock is on the left. The, the green is Safford andesite. You can see the uh, the vertical, the vertically dipping series of uh, dikes that cross cut the stock, and some cross cut the the diatremes, and some were instrumental in forming the di uh, diatreme, and then the uh, volcanics that are on top. You can see from this, the system appears to be tilted to the northeast 10 to 15 degrees, but it's basically upright and intact. So I put on this is um, a copper shale that's based on a point greater than 0.3 total copper value that gives you a sense of where the mineralization is in relationship to uh, the rocks I've just mentioned. And the thing of note is how close it came to the surface. You think that's pretty close, but to strip that, look at the material that you're looking at having to strip to open it up. That's one of the reasons I think that Lone Star has, was never really mined is because of the economics and the things in front. But now it's been opened up and um, doing quite well, I understand. So part of the, process, part of the th things I was involved with at Freeport is I work with Mark Barton and some uh, many of his uh, students towards obtaining zircon dates for a lot of the intrusions that Freeport has in Arizona, New Mexico, and Colorado. Colorado. And um, this was a process I think that started 2004 or five and continued until I retired and it's produced a, an immense amount of uh, dates and so this is a little bit about the procedure in, in doing that. All of this stuff was done at the University of Arizona. The, uh, separate the zircons and you go through this and you laser ablate those and the, um, the zircons are tar targeted from cores to, to rims and it results in these uh, plots that you see on the right. So moving a little deeper, these are getting into the rock types. These are the pre-hypogene -hy rocks. The upper one is um, Safford andesite. Danny Russin, who did a master's at the University of Arizona, obtained a, a zircon date of that of 73. These are our flows, a uh, wide range of textures. I'll talk more about what the compositions are in a subsequent slide. The drilling never got out of it. I mean, we were looking at thicknesses in excess of two kilometers. Uh, there were uh, rafted blocks of, of Paleozoic rocks that we would hit, but never saw anything that was intact. In place within that is the Lone Star stock. It's got a date of about 66. 
It's a composite pluton, quartz diorite, granite diorite phases. Um, it's cut by the dikes and really is a host to the ore, but didn't, we don't think, can contributed any copper to it. This is a TAS diagram of the, of the, of the Safford Cretaceous volcanic rocks. You can see the Lone Star area. Dos Pobres is, is to the uh, northwest, and Markham Wash is to the northwest of that. So you can see in the array of plots, they vary from almost basaltic to basaltic andesite all the way up to rhyolite. So when I sampled this, I tried to get as clean as rock as I possibly could. And uh, that's a result from that. Um, moving into the, in, to the dikes and the stocks that were important in forming the deposit, there's four, maj four major dikes. Three of those uh, are all altered by K-silicate alteration. The oldest is the day site. That's the one in the up upper left. can't really, it's got a date of about 56. It's, it, it's cross cut by all these other dikes. The, the, it's followed by a quartz latite, a quartz, mon, mon, quartz monzonite, and all of those, like I said, are altered by K-silicate Assem, assemblages. The square quartz porphyry only contains quartz with pyrite as veinlets in, in the, and no calc pyrite. So, when we sampled this, thought this could be one that could be key at least to attempt to bracket the age of the, min the mineralization. The other thing that was interesting, and because of the drilling at the time was so wide spaced, in the area near where the annex is, we drilled into a quartz monzonite porphyry, a stock. Don't know anything about the size because the drill spacing was so wide. But it contains the unidirectional solidification textures, mostly as cranulate layers, a high silica zone, and uh, cut by quartz molybdenite veinlets. The diatremes were um, important, not so much as an ore host, but as a source for leaching that formed some of the calcocyte deposits. There's four of them at the time that was identified. There's more that extend on the range front to the southwest. Um, placed within the, they were in place within the Safford andesite. They're steep walls. They tend to flare upward. They have banded with epiclastic textures. Uh, they grade down, downward into a heterolithic breccia for the most part centered on quartz monzonite dikes. Uh, they're all altered by K-silicate um, assemblages and you can see in this thing, I'll just, I'll highlight it and turn it off, but clearly heterolithic frag fragments. The matrix is secondary biotite, uh, cross cut by quartz biotite white case, case bar vein, veinlets. And the lower one, you can see the outline of the fragments that are rimmed by secondary biotite, biotite um, cut by hairline biotite veinlets, and some with, with quartz. So um, pretty interesting rock, and sometimes they're so altered you don't know what the original fragment was lithology. So overlying, I've talked about the Oligocene and Miocene volcanic rocks. Uh, the oldest is a volcano of Bear Springs, that's to the north. It consists of flows and a dome complex. Uh, it's never been dated, but according to Hauser, is, uh, she thought it was around 24 to 26. And then a younger one, which is an andesite, that's the one that sits directly atop most of the Lone Star deposit. That's got a KAR date of about 24. Um, they're just post-volcanic post rocks. There's, 
There's a paleosol that was uh, formed part due to the erosion that these, that these volcanic rocks were deposited on. And it's generally filled um, lower areas in the relief of little canyons and drainages. It's discontinuous, but was a concern because some uh, geomechanical engineers thought it might have slope stability issues. Like I mentioned, in terms of structure, the deposit is up, upright, but it is tilted. I think we think about 10 to 15 degrees to the northeast. Um, the structure consists of an early series of northwest trending faults that are cut by northeast faults that actually were controlled to a lot of the dikes and some of the hypogene veins. And those, in turn, are cut by northwest striking faults thought to be related to basin and range. Hydrothermal alteration. So the dominant alteration type is really K silica K. Um, there's two basic zones. There's a, deep, a deeper zone, which consists of, um, well, there's some isolated sodic calcic and EDMs along the flanks of some of the deep, deeper in the system along the flanks of the shells. But basically, it's characterized by pervasive biotite, magnetite in the andesite, which is in turn cut by hairline biotite, chalcopyrite, minor quartz. Most of some of these veins are early, they're hairline, they're wavy, they're diffuse. Some have um, pretty wide ha halos, like you see on the uh, image on the upper left. But what, some of the things that's notable is the absence of quartz. Quartz is an accessory, but it's not a major constitu constituent. I would say a large part, the veinlets are thin. If they are, they're biotitic. And in some cases where they are better developed, they're wide halos with thin veinlet centers. Situated above that is a broad zone of quartz, case bar, biotite, chalcopyrite. Um, the ground mass is still variably replaced by biotite and magnetite, but you start seeing the introduction of biotite quartz with chalcopyrite, with chalcopyrite cut by quartz introduction of more case bar, chalcopyrite, magnetite, and chlorite. And then fi f finally, like you see, there's a lot of veins that are just mostly just chalcopyrite only veins, very little pyrite, if anything. No real alteration, halo, some of these are upwards of almost a centimeter wide. One of the characteristics there is quartz is abundant in the veinlets and it's more fracture con controlled versus the uh, style of alteration that's deeper. There's a widespread significant uh, chloride overprint of biotite in the pervasive and along halos. And then of course there's sericitic above the K silicate and uh, Outer propolytic is epidochlorite carbonate. Um, talk a little bit about the epidochlorite there. There's a regional sort of uh, chloride epidote that you see. Some people called it baboon volcanics. It had a wide range. So it's difficult to say is what's really related to the porphyry system versus this regional thing. And I don't think that's been adequately resolved. So people have looked at this area with green rock studies and all these kind of things, and I think it's relatively inconclusive in terms of their results, so that's something that probably needs additional work. So here's a couple images of what the sodic calcic and some of the USTs look, look like. You can see the one on the left. Epidote, the green, and the albite, this is replacing um, sapphire andesite that is in turn cut by magnetite, quartz, chloride, chalcopyrite, case bar valence. Several generations 
can see that this one looks like it might be offset by the one coming in from the left. We really don't know the distribution, at least at the time, because these were isolated hits and the drill spacing was so wide, but I think it's interesting that these sorts of occurrences can be documented there. And the other one are these USTs, or unidirectional solidification textures. This is in a quartz monzonite. You can see those white bands of quartz, and between our case bar, looks like there might be quartz. Um, you typically see these in molybdenum systems, but I think they're being recognized in more copper moly porf porphyries. Um, the one on the bottom, you'll see that prominent uh, quartz band. This is, to me, almost looks like an EDM, where a thin valent with a wide uh, biotite halo, and you'd say, well, looks like the quartz cuts the, the EDM, but actually it doesn't. You'd have to look at that, but there's, the EDM is actually later than the uh, UST. So moving on to the hypogene, uh, copper and uh, molybdenum mineralization. Um, copper forms an inverted cup-shaped cup shell that's elongated northeast and southwest. The shell is de defined by a, a greater than 0.3% copper values. At the time, I show these wonderfully smooth contacts, but that's not really the case. It's just for illustrative things, but you can see with the block model that are colored by, the blocks are colored by a copper grade. It has that general form, but it's complex on a local scale. Widths of the shell are variable, and at the time were not fully defined by drilling. Um, copper occurs as calcopyrite with lesser pyrite. The majority of those are within K-silicate vein, veinlets and halos. Overall, the, the grades tend to vary from 0.3 to 0.5% total copper, but there are exceptions with zones of um, 0.7 to 0.9. That was one of the intersects in, uh, zones that we drilled with one of the holes was situated over here. So if you look at this thing, you can see on the flanks, there's some magenta and red colored blocks at some of the higher grades, and we honestly don't fully understand why the grades are higher in those areas versus elsewhere. Uh, the molly grades are generally low. Uh, we couldn't really identify a molly shell. There could be one with better drilling in the southwest. I wouldn't be surprised if something is localized along around that uh, quartz monzonite with, with USTs in the high silica zone and the quartz molly veins, but the amount of drilling wasn't sufficient to identify it then. So if you look at the block model, and you start putting together, well, okay, you talk about all these K-silicate types, well, where are they? So this is, what I've done is I've overlay, I've put on, on here, the upper limit of pervasive biotite in white, pervasive magnetite in orange, and case bar in magenta. You can see that on both sides. The lower limit of sericitic is the blue line that sort of looks through the bottom and then outward are propolytic zones. So that's more of the pervasive alteration. Okay, now let's take a look at the, the veinlets and their distribution. So one of the things in looking at the core um, that I noticed was calcopyrite tended to be localized in biotite chlorite and magnetite veinlets. So what I did is I plotted on there, what's the upper limit of those veinlets in core? And you can see the distribution of upper, upper bio, biotite on the left and the magenta moves over. But if you look at this, you'll see for the, a large part, the copper grades are basically enclosed within chlorite bearing calcopyrite veins. So that's uh, something to think about when we model these things as we talk about K-silicate alteration, but I would argue that there's subsets of that are probably critically important to understand in terms of where the copper distributions really are within those type of alteration zones. 
So, so this is an age plot of the zircon dates that we have from the Safford district. Uh, showing on here are the uranium lead from this work is in red. Potassium argon is in brown, and the, the, the center of that shape is where the, uh, the value is, and then the, the points represent what the air is. And there's, you can see that the early Safford and, and, and the site's the oldest. You know, you get quite an array of ages for the Lone Star stock. The uranium lead that we have is 67 or, or so. Again, these are all pre-hybrid gene. Uh, the Sol system, which is a uneconomic pyrite-rich deposit south east of uh, Sanchez, doesn't have a lot of work. But then San Juan, that's a porphyry system uh, between Lone Star and Dos Pobres. The Sanchez deposit, which is on the southeast side of the, of the zone. Dos Pobres itself. Three zircon dates and two rhenium osmium that Danny Russin obtained as part of his work, and the Lone Star system there. So you can look at those dates for yourself and kind of get a sense of the distribution of ages in the Safford district. They seem to cluster 55 to 70 or so. By comparison, uh, Marinci's probably 56. And then the reason the mine is there, the super, the super chain. So there, um, this is pretty interesting because it emphasizes the role of a host rock versus other sorts of deposits. I'll talk about that a little, little bit. But uh, multiple, multiple super gene cycles produced a complex profile that now exists of a upper leach cap zone, oxide copper that consists of green, black and red oxides. You can read those for yourself. The more prominent ones are chrysocolla and brochantite, but black copper oxides as copper, iron, manganese, mineraloids are common. And there's also significant amount locally of native copper and cuprite. We tend to lo see those at the top of the system for along ma major faults. Below that is a mixed oxide calcocyte zone, uh, thin enrichment that's very irregular, and that lies above a mixed calcocyte calcopyrite zone that transitions into the hypogene. The uh, supergene is localized near the top upper part of the copper shell. Uh, I'll show that. Um, some in interesting sidelights is the diatremes and the felsic dites are, are more felsic and they were susceptible to leaching and remobilization of copper versus the andesite that, that uh, wasn't really leached extensively. So that's the source of the calcocyte blanket where we think where the diatremes and felsic dikes, whereas the oxide in the andesite was basically an in situ oxidation of what was calcopyrite. Uh, the supergism is still pretty, it's fairly big. It's about two kilometers across and extends to a depth of uh, one kilom kilometer. Here's a cross section that shows the uh, various ore types. Um, the green is a mixture of green oxide and black. But notice the red is the enrichment. It's anything but a blanket. Very complex. I think the system has is, is, is seen various stage, stages of leaching and enrichment where things like faults and dia, diatremes and the character of the host rock has influenced the distribution and form of some of these uh, supergene uh, deposits. Um, but recognize maybe two, probably three major state uh, uh, cycles of supergene activity. I think the oldest is likely Eocene. Don't really have a date on that, but uh, other deposits in Arizona have that where I believe that the system was leached and, 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 and the 
to form the in and uh, the dia the diatremes and dikes were leached and enriched. Uh, in situ oxidation of the copper shale in the andesite. Some similar grades, and then there was leaching again of the calcocyte to, uh, to produce the hematitic capping found adjacent to chrysocolla within andesite. And then that was covered by these volcanic rocks and essentially protected it. And then with the onset of, uh, we think, basin and range, change in uh, the uplift, change in the water, table, the cycle was rejuvenated and tend to see leaching um, on the range front closer to some of the faults that were uh, um, not covered by vol volcanic rocks. There's one super, there's two super gene alunite dates of about, tw they vary from 12 to 14, which supports the age of this later uh, cy cycle. So wrapping up here, so one of the ma major points, it's, um, it's located on a series of diatreme and felsic dike swarms within andesite, K-silicate, I've talked about that, it's the dominant alterations type. Uh, Supergene is located at the apex of the hypogene sh uh, shell, but uh, I think the type and kind of alteration and the extent and character of the supergene is related to the fact that dominant host rock is an andesite versus uh, Marinci, where these are felsic rocks and somewhat don't have a lot of buffering cap of capability, whereas the andesite does. And you think about case silicate, we need to know what the rocks are to understand that. Um, there's still a lot of exploration potential to expand and define the resource. So we talked a little bit, we talked about Dos Pobres and Lone Star. So how do they compare to the behemoth to the north, northeast? And I plotted uh, at about the same scale, the three D deposits. So the thing to note about Dos Pobres is half of the deposit has been faulted down. So that's why it sort of looked like it's truncated. The thing at Marinci shows a cluster of pits. This is a couple years old. There's more pits that basically are surround or proximal to uh, Monzonite porphyry and OGP stocks. And then Lone Star system to the uh, right. So you can see Lone Star is approaching mammoth size. Um, so if you look at, well, how do these compare? So I just plotted some things down in terms of the, the magmatism, the age, and the size of these things for Lone Star, Dos Pobres, and Marinci. Uh, about the same age. The sizes vary quite a bit, but in general, all of them start with a dacite or granite diorite or the early rocks that gradually through additional magmatism end up as monzonites or quartz monzonites, in some cases actually rhyol rhyolites. Uh, the mineralization is commonly in the form of ore shells. Um, I think there's one that we know of at Lone Star that could be mul multiple. It wouldn't so, so surprise me that there, that there could be. Dos Pobres is, character, is notable because of the boronite and the gold contents versus the, the other. Gold tends to be associated with uh, boronite at Dos, po Dos Pobres and the mineralization characteristics there are not really an ore shell, but just a diffuse mass of boronite calcopyrite centered on a swarm of uh, dikes. At Marinci, there's multiple ore shells. Clearly, at least two, maybe three ma major ore shells that are re related to uh, the MB, MP, and two might be related to OGP stocks. Um, I put on there just the size. This is from the Freeport uh, 2022 10K. It sort of gives a sense of the size. Uh, Freeport 
combines those pull rates and Lone Star into the same, so you can't really separate or get a sense of what the sizes are for each one, but it gives you sort of a sense. But uh, really, the only one that has notable gold is those pull po rates. And then moving on to the super gene, um, like I mentioned before, this is a, an interesting thing where you're, you're looking at the role of, a, of an andesite versus felsic rocks and what type of super gene systems do you get related to that. Um, each of the deposits probably have maybe two major episodes of super gene. Um, some work at Marinci Mer indicates there could be multiple cycles even within that that are the young uh, side of things. Um, leech cap, uh, it's, they're hematitic in the dikes, in the diet, diet, in the diatreme. There's widespread hematite with gertite in the andesite, usually proximal to some of these dikes. At Marinci, it's absolutely huge. It's, it's got an expansive QSP alteration zone, and that was the stuff that was leached several times and enriched, and it produces some world-class live limonite, hematite-rich cap, capping. Uh, the mineralogy, oxide mineralogy, most of them, they have chrysocolla, variable amounts of black oc oxides, the amount of native copper and cuprite is variable as well. That Marinci, the largest amount of those were in oxidized scarn, typically within shale uh, protoliths. And I think I'd like to acknowledge a lot of, uh, I'm giving the talk, but a lot of people did some work. First off, thank Freeport. Mac Moran, in particular, Mac Camby, for permission to present this. Um, a gentleman here actually was part of the Bear Creek effort in the 50s, who worked with Anand Cook and Ray Robinson. Um, and those at the University of Arizona, Mark, Barton, Eric, Roy Gregg, a PhD student, Mark Pecca, who runs some of the instruments, and Simone. And then with Phelps Dodge and Freeport, I, if I left somebody off, it wasn't the intent, but uh, Mike Pulowski, he's, he's passed, but he was the uh, person who did a lot of work early on with Freeport, um, with Randy White, Berkeley Tracy, Jeff Gurvey, Bill Stavis, Jerry Wagley, Mika, Paul, Rob Williams, he's handled the logistics, did an outstanding job. Witty Parks, Sam, Jennifer, Andrew Early, who's now the chief geologist at uh, Lone, Lone Star, and Stephanie Anderson. So here's a photo of some of them in the place where we used to do all the work um, that doesn't exist any, anymore, but it was fun while it lasted, right, Jerry? <laughs> and thank you.